When a heart muscle contracts, it generates an active force, in other words, an active tension. The amount of blood which is pumped during contraction, I mean the stroke volume, actually depends on the overall force of contraction. An active force generated by the heart muscle during systole is directly proportional to number of cross bridges that are cycling in that muscle. The more cross bridges that cycle, the greater the force of contraction. The number of cross bridges during systole depends on the preload factor and the contractility factor. In a previous video, we have already discussed preload, so in this video we will talk about contractility in detail, the second factor that affects the systolic performance of the ventricle, and we will see how it differs from preload factor. Now each of these three hearts are filled with 140 ml of blood. Uh, in other words, all three hearts have the same preload. When a heart in the middle contracts, suppose it pumps 70 ml out of 140 ml of blood, and suppose we say it is a result of an optimal contractility and the resting condition. On the other hand, when a first heart contracts, suppose it pumps only 40 ml out of 140. This means that having the same preload as the second heart, it pumps less amount of blood when compared to the heart in the middle. This is because of decreased contractility. When the last heart contracts, suppose it pumps 120 ml out of 140 ml of preload. This means having the same preload as the second heart, it pumps the most blood. This is because of increased contractility. To sum it up, all hearts have the same preload and the only difference is performance of the heart, in other words, the force of contraction. Having said that, this concludes that contractility by definition is a change in the force of contraction at any given preload. Now, it is very important to differentiate between preload and contractility because it is heavily tested on USMLE step 1. And the best way to visually see the difference between them is to demonstrate them on a graph. So first, let us see what is preload. I hope you remember that after the ventricle contracts and ejects the blood, still some amount of blood remains in the ventricle. This volume is called end systolic volume and is approximately equal to 70 ml at rest. During diastole, another 70 ml of blood comes in via the atrium, and this 70 ml plus 70 ml of end systolic volume equals 140 ml, which is referred to as end diastolic volume. This volume causes the ventricle to stretch. Therefore, the end diastolic volume by definition is what is called preload because you know that the preload is a load or pre-stretch on the ventricular muscle at the end of diastole. So let's deal with the graph. On the x-axis we have ventricular preload and on the y-axis we have systolic performance which I will define as stroke volume. Suppose at rest the preload is 140 ml and a stroke volume is uh, 70 ml. This means the ventricle receives 70 ml and ejects 70 ml during systolic contraction. So, under resting conditions, the ventricle operates somewhere at this point. Let's refer this point as the control point. If I increase the preload by 60 ml from 140, up to 200 ml. This stretches the ventricular muscle more and more cross bridges will cycle and we see an increase in the force of contraction. As a consequence, the stroke volume increases by 60 ml from 70 ml up to 130 ml. Therefore, the next ventricular systolic performance will be here at this point. As you see, the same amount of blood that is received by the ventricle will be pumped out. 
This phenomenon is known as a frank starling mechanism that attempts to match venous return with cardiac output. If the preload remains unchanged, it is, it is 140 mils, but the stroke volume is increased, suppose from 70 mils up to 100 mils. In other words, the ventricle is receiving 70 mils, however it is pumping 100 mils. This means that the performance of the ventricle is increased at the given preload. If the performance of the ventricle is increased while preload is not changed, this is because of increased contractility. Again, from control point to point B, we have increased in performance of the ventricle because of increased preload via Frank Starling mechanism. What happened to contractility? The answer is nothing. The contractility is the same in the entire length of line. However, from the control point to point A, we have increased in performance despite the preload has not been changed. If the performance of the ventricle increases while preload is not increased, this is because of increased contractility. It is very important to note that the diastolic pressure under resting conditions is 80 mm of mercury. In order for the left ventricle to eject blood to the aorta, it should contract and pressurize more than 80 mm of mercury uh, of aortic pressure. Only then the valve opens and ejection begins because it is always the pressure difference across the valve that opens or closes the valve. In the early stages of hypertension, because the diastolic pressure increases more than 80 mm of mercury, suppose up to 95, the ventricle should contract more forcefully to pressurize more than 95 of aortic pressure and open the valve. This means we have an increased ventricular performance at a normal preload because of increase in contractility. However, there is no increase in ejection fraction. And the acute conditions, the change in contractility is because of change in calcium dynamics. More free calcium in a cytosol means more cross bridges will cycle. More cross bridges cycling increases the force of contraction at the given preload. Less free calcium in a cytosol means less cross bridges will cycle. Less cross bridges cycling decreases the force of contraction at the given preload. Under chronic conditions, the change in contractility is due to other mechanisms. In floor output heart failure, the decreased systolic performance of the ventricle is due to myocyte dysfunction. For example, in the case of myocardial infarction. Well, as for the preload, the preload effect can be explained on the basis of a change in sarcomere length. In other words, within the physiologic limit, the more you stretch the sarcomere, the more you increase the force of contraction. Also, it is extremely important to note that the stretching of the sarcomere, in other words, increasing the preload, also increases the sensitivity of the contractile machinery to calcium. Therefore, preload and contractility are not completely independent. Now, let's talk about the indices of contractility. There are three common indices of contractility. Ejection fraction, maximal DPDT during isovolumetric contraction, and peak aortic velocity during ventricular ejection. Well, actually, there is no ideal index of contractility, but in a clinical practice, the best index of contractility that is used is ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the fraction of the ventricular volume ejected during systole. It is calculated by following formula. Ejection fraction equals stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. 
stroke volume under resting conditions is 70 mils and diastolic volume is 140 mils. So we get 0.5 and in the percentages we say it is 55%. Actually down to 39% is considered to be normal but not below 39. Increased contractility increases ejection fraction. Decreased contractility decreases ejection fraction. As we said, we do not have any ideal index of contractility. All three are sensitive to something and ejection fraction is not exception. Ejection fraction is not an ideal index of contractility because it is afterload sensitive. Increased afterload decreases the ejection fraction whereas decreased afterload increases ejection fraction. It is very important to note that the diastolic pressure is considered as an index of afterload. And the resting conditions, it is 80 millimeters of mercury. In order for the left ventricle to eject blood to the aorta, it should contract and pressurize more than 80 millimeters of mercury of aortic pressure. Only then the valve opens and ejection begins because it is always the pressure difference across the valve that opens or closes the valve. In the early stages of hypertension, because the diastolic pressure increases more than 80 millimeters of mercury, suppose up to 95, the left ventricle should contract more forcefully to pressurize more than 95 and open the valve. This means we have an increased ventricular performance at a normal preload. This increase in ventricular performance is because of the increase in contractility. However, there is no increase in ejection fraction. So this is the reason why the ejection fraction is not an ideal index of contractility. The second index of contractility is maximal DP-DT during isovolumetric contraction. DP is the change in pressure and DT is the change in time. The isovolumetric contraction is the early period of systole. In this period, the ventricle contracts as a closed chamber because all the valves are closed. The ejection phase begins only when we reach a certain pressure to cause the opening of valve. So I put a pressure measuring device in both ventricles and see how the ventricular pressure changes during isovolumetric contraction. That is what the DPDT means. Now I am sure you are noting that the pressure is increasing faster in a heart on the left when compared to the right heart. We are reaching 80 millimeters of mercury in a short time in the left heart when compared to the right heart that takes longer to reach 80 millimeters of mercury. This means the contractility is greater in a heart on the left when compared to the heart on the right. In other words, the heart on the left is contracting forcefully, thus you will develop the pressure faster in a short time. Let's demonstrate this graphically. Here we have the left ventricular pressure and here the time. The pressure in the first ventricle increases rapidly whereas in the second gradually. Therefore we get the steep line in the first and flatter in the second ventricle. This concludes the slope is equal to contractility. In other words, slope is a function of calcium dynamics during systole. Increased slope means contractility increases because of increased calcium dynamics. Decreasing slope means decreasing contractility because of decreased calcium dynamics. Another important point to remember is that the DPDT is also not an ideal index of contractility because it is sensitive to preload. Increased preload increases DPDT, whereas decreasing preload decreases DPDT.
Now, let's see how sympathetic stimulation versus increased preload change DP, DT, and how they appear differently in a graph. This is heavily tested on USMLE step 1. It is worth a moment to repeat one more time that contractility is directly proportional to the number of cross bridges that are cycling in that muscle. The number of cross bridges is in turn directly proportional to intracellular calcium concentration. Increased intracellular calcium concentration increases the number of cross bridges, which in turn increases contractility. The sympathetic stimulation to the heart has the same effect. It speeds up calcium dynamics, leading to increase in contractility. So this concludes that contractility is an extrinsically regulated factor and not an inherent property of the myocardium itself. It is under nervous control and the output is mainly sympathetic. The norepinephrine released by sympathetic nervous system and circulating epinephrine and norepinephrine stimulate the beta-1 receptors in the myocardium. Beta-1 receptors inside are coupled with stimulatory G protein. So epinephrine and norepinephrine activate stimulatory G protein. Stimulatory G protein in turn activates adenyl cyclase. Then activation of adenyl cyclase leads to the production of cyclic adenosine monophosphate from ATP. Increased cyclic AMP in turn activates a cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. Protein kinase has two main important effects. First, it phosphorylates sarcolemal L type calcium channels, causing them to open. As a consequence, this causes increased calcium entry into the cell during the plateau phase of the action potential. Increased calcium entry during action potentials leads to enhanced release of calcium by the sarcoplasmic reticulum in a heart by mechanism known as calcium-induced calcium release. You already know that more calcium means more cross bridge cycle and contractility increases. Second, protein kinase causes phosphorylation of phospholamban. When phosphorylated, this protein stimulates the calcium ATPase in sarcoplasmic reticulum, resulting in greater uptake and storage of calcium there. Increased calcium uptakes by the sarcoplasmic reticulum has two effects. First, it causes faster relaxation because it uptakes the calcium that participated in contraction immediately after it does its job. Second, it increases the amount of stored calcium for release on subsequent beats because at every beat a lot of calcium enters the cell via phosphorylated L-type calcium channels. To sum it up, sympathetic stimulation causes phosphorylation of sarcolemal L-type calcium channels and phosphorylation of phospholamban. This speeds up the calcium dynamics. Increased intracellular calcium concentration means more cross bridges will cycle. As a consequence, contractility increases. This is referred as positive inotropic effect of the sympathetic nervous system on contractile myocardium. It is very important to know that if sympathetic stimulation cannot maintain an adequate systolic performance of the ventricle, this is referred to as systolic dysfunction. It is very important to note that cardiac glycosides have the same effect as sympathetic stimulation. They also have positive inotropic effect on a heart muscle. One of the classic example of that group is digoxin. Dejoxin inhibits sodium potassium ATPase at the extracellular potassium binding site. As a consequence, the intracellular sodium concentration increases. Because of the decreased sodium concentration gradient, calcium-sodium exchanger will be inhibited. 
This exchanger actually pumps three sodium in down its electrical gradient and one calcium out of the cell. The energy for pumping calcium uphill comes from the downhill sodium gradient, which is normally maintained by the sodium potassium ATPase. Inhibition of sodium potassium ATPase slows down the job of calcium sodium exchanger. As a consequence, the intracellular free calcium concentration increases. More calcium means more cross bridges will cycle, increasing contractility. Now let's demonstrate graphically and see how sympathetic stimulation affects the DPDT because it is commonly tested in USMLE step 1. On the y axis, we have the ventricular pressure. And on x-axis, we have the time. The blue line represents the DPDT suppose under control conditions, and red one under sympathetic stimulation. The positive inotropic effect of sympathetic stimulation on ventricular muscle causes four changes in our graph. First, it increases DPDT. This occurs because sympathetic stimulation to the ventricle increases the release of calcium. Because calcium will be released faster, the rate of ventricular pressure development increases. So we see a steeper slope, and you already know that slope is equal to contractility and is a function of calcium dynamics. Second, peak left ventricular pressure increases. This is happening because more calcium will be involved in contraction via calcium-induced calcium release mechanism, resulting in a more forcefully contraction. Third, the rate of ventricular relaxation increases. This occurs because calcium will be removed faster from contraction machinery due to increased activity of calcium ATPase in a sarcoplasmic reticulum and we get this steeper downslope. Overall, you release the calcium faster, more calcium becomes involved in contraction, and you remove calcium faster. We speed up calcium dynamics. A very important point here, because this line is steeper and this line is steeper, the systolic interval narrows. This means we spent less time in systole. So fourth effect of sympathetic stimulation will be decreasing systolic interval. Another important point to mention is that the increased preload also increases peak left ventricular pressure because preload also increases the force of contraction. The only difference is that in preload, we do not have a significant change in a systolic interval. This is a really high yield for the USMLE step 1. It is very important to note, in addition of positive inotropic effect, the sympathetic system also increases the heart rate via stimulation of SA node. This is referred as positive chronotropic effect. Whereas contractility affects the systolic interval, the heart rate determines the diastolic interval. This increased sympathetic activity to the heart increases the heart rate that leads to decreasing the diastolic interval. In addition, the sympathetic stimulation also increases the conduction velocity of the action potential via AV node. This is referred as a positive dramatropic effect. Perhaps it may sound surprising to you, but changes in heart rate produce change in contractility. When a heart rate increases, contractility increases. When a heart rate decreases, contractility decreases. The mechanism is not difficult to understand. When a heart rate increases, there are more action potentials per unit time and an increase in the total amount of trigger calcium that enters the cell during the plateau phase of the action potentials. With each beat, more calcium is accumulated by the sarcoplasmic reticulum until a maximum storage level is achieved. 
So contractility rises stepwise like a staircase and then it remains at a maximal level. This effect literally is known as a positive staircase effect or bulge staircase effect or trapper phenomenon. The third index of contractility is peak aortic velocity during ventricular ejection. Increased velocity means increased contractility. But this index is also not the best index because it is afterload sensitive. Increased afterload decreases peak aortic velocity, whereas decreased afterload increases it. Now, let's quickly repeat one more time what we have said and perhaps add some important details. When a heart muscle contracts, it generates an active force, in other words, an active tension. The amount of blood which is pumped during contraction, I mean the stroke volume, depends on the overall force of contraction. An active force generated by the heart muscle during systole is proportional to number of cross bridges that are cycling in that muscle. The more cross bridges that cycle, the greater the force of contraction. The number of cross bridges during systole depends on a preload factor and a contractility factor. In short, preload is a pre-stretch of myocardium. Increased preload increases the number of cross bridges that in turn increases the force of contraction. Contractility is a factor of cytosolic calcium concentration. Increased cytosolic calcium increases the contractility because of increased the number of cross bridges, and that in turn increases the force of contraction.